the earlier the Bible study, we uh, took on the subject of keys to perfection, ten keys to perfection found in the book of James, and uh, we had a handout, and I don't know if there's still some around or if you, if you need any, but uh, I'll just uh, briefly, we covered the first five, and uh, uh, I mentioned that these keys to perfection, that could sound like a, uh, you know, a really, I guess, uh, lofty aspirations, and once we achieve them, then uh, we're almost there, perfect, but we really know that perfection for us in this life is dealing with spiritual maturity, and this could also be subtitled 10 Blessings from the book of James that enhances and makes our lives more abundant and makes it better for those whom we love, those around us, and uh, our friends, communities, co-workers. So if we just think of, as we go through this, if in the world, if just some of these were practiced, and if we could practice them even more, and that's really the only person we can change is ourselves to do do these more and to and to put them into action but uh we we would think the world if not at least it would not probably be perfect but it would sure be a lot more mature and uh we just realize every day in the news the things we hear the uh just our society uh degenerating the devalue of of life of human life and what little it means to society today and just uh all the the uh the antics of of some of the people uh you know are, who are not mature and we just see that and it's uh it makes the news and we need we could use a little bit of spiritual maturity in our society but the first one was the first key to perfection or spiritual maturity was enduring trials and that's just a common factor to all men is we will have trials and we endure those yes as brethren as, as Christians and we're praying for many right now who, who are in severe trials and uh, so that's the the first uh, key to perfection the second one was good comes from God and uh, James mentions that every good and perfect gift is of God and, and from God and we mentioned that in order to take advantage of those we need to put them into practice to to uh to learn them and that uh, uh is part of that walk we have with with jesus christ and the third key to perfection is that we realize that wisdom comes from god the man although many times we think we've got it all figured out and uh you know and try to do things without god uh wisdom Knowledge, understanding is a gift from God. Then the fourth key to perfection is to be a doer of the word. Like I mentioned, he, he gives us the knowledge of those gifts, but we must do something with them. We must put them into action, into our lives. And uh, our lives are the only ones we can uh, really do that with. But our example can be a benefit to others and to society. And then the fifth uh, key was... To control the tongue and uh, that's a, a very big subject uh, and a very important one and a very serious one uh, because of the consequences some of the proverbs we read of where there's you know life and death are in the power of the tongue and uh, so those were the the first five keys and we will look at uh, the next five and I'll promise you this will be a brief sermon so we won't be here very long, but we will go back to the book of James, and I think I lost my place there, so I'll get back there. And what we will look at first is uh, in our sixth key to perfection or spiritual uh, maturity in James is to love not the world. Now that seems like it contradicts a, a very... Uh, famous scripture or a popular scripture that uh, of God of God and his nature and his way that he so loved the world but then we're saying here to love not the world but we realize God we're not talking about the people we're not to hate the people we're to hate the evil and the uh, deception 
and the uh, way of society that is against God. And that is what uh, James is talking about. And we always, I mean, we often say, well, we are to uh, hate the sin and love the sinner. And uh, that is very difficult to do. And I'm not sure any man is, is really capable of doing that to the fullest extent. But our Heavenly Father, who so loved the world, he can hate the sin, as he tells us throughout his word, and still love the entire world. And uh, uh, we're so thankful to have him as the judge and as the king of the universe. So I reference this in James, the fourth chapter, and beginning in verse 3. James 4, verse 3, it says, You ask and receive not because you consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, you know not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever there will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so there are the, the strong words against the, uh, the being a friend of the evils in society. And, you know, we just, we have so much bad news. So we have human trafficking, we have drugs, we have all the problems. And there are, are people willfully, willingly pursuing those things. And that's the evil, you know, that, that we certainly hate. And uh, any families who are victims of that uh, certainly hate it. And God hates it, as we are reading. So I'd like to turn to, still in the general epistles, uh, over to the first John, the second chapter. And uh, the Apostle John addresses this subject too. And uh, 1 John 2, beginning in verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and here are like three main categories of, of lust and evil in the world, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And as we know, upon Christ's return, the world passes away, and the lust also passes away. But he that does the will of God will abide forever. So loving not the world is a key to spiritual maturity. And upon God having that part of the world pass away, it is definitely a key to perfection. Number seven as the uh, key to perfection in the book of James is humility. And in James the fourth chapter once again in verse six, and uh, some of these points are all right here together in these verses. Verse six we read, but he gives more grace, wherefore he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we are eternally thankful for God's grace that he will give salvation to sinners. We're also very grateful for his mercy, the mercy that he extends. And he, it said he, you know, would uh, give, but gives grace unto the humble. Gives, and he mentions giving more grace. And I would say the humble are those who could receive more mercy because God tells us what he thinks of the humble compared to the arrogant, the proud, the boast, those who boast. Then I will turn over back to the first Peter, the book of first Peter chapter five and kind of have an example of of how this works when humility first peter 5 verse 6 says humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of god that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him for he cares for you and i thought you know that's a form of grace or a form of mercy is when we cast our care to god and he handles those problems for us. 
or helps us get through them. That is him showing us mercy. So that statement where he, get, he gives more grace or he gives more mercy would tend to have us pay attention to that key of humility is one of the keys to uh, spiritual maturity or perfection. And we live in a world that's men in our human nature, men, women in our human nature. We always want to be moving up, being promoted, you know, getting bigger, getting better. So I'd like to turn to Psalm, the 75th chapter, and kind of has a perspective on promotion, on achievements, and where, where true promotion comes from, and especially spiritual promotion. In Psalm 75, and I'll, I'll read quite a bit of the chapter, beginning in verse 1. Unto you, O God, do we give, give thanks. Unto you do we give thanks. For that thy name is near your wondrous works. Declare. So it's a, pray, a, God of, a, a psalm of praise and, and worshiping God and recognizing him. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. Repeated that. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift, up, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. You know, arrogant, proud, bo boisterous. For promotion, verse 6, comes neither from the east, nor the west, nor the south. But God is the judge. He puts one down and sets up another. For in the hand of God there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he pours it out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing the praises of the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So humility, a key to perfection in the book of James spiritual maturity, uh, recognition of where true promotion comes from, and another gift from our God. The next key is that of submission. And once again, we're right here in the same cluster of verses in, in James 4. And in verse 7, we read, Submit your, yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And I once again go back over to First Peter, the fifth chapter, and we kind of continue on where we left off there, uh, talking about humility. Continuing on with submission in verse 8, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So we submit to God, but we resist the devil. We resist the evils of society. And we know from Revelation 12, 9, that that old serpent, Satan the devil, who has deceives the whole world, one way to submit is to resist him to resist the evils of society and these points are kind of kind of intertwined and then to submit to him and we mentioned in the bible study earlier from Romans 6 that we are servants of whom we yield ourselves to obey so we submit to our savior Jesus Christ and his father and do not submit and bow to the evils of this world and in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, we need that submission in order to, and I won't turn there, but just mention that there are fiery darts fired at us all the time. And through that submission and resisting, we, we are able then to uh, withstand and go forward with 
our job of working on these uh, keys to perfection and spiritual maturity in our own lives. The ninth key to spiritual maturity or perfection is uh, very close here. Same, in the same verse, James 4, 7, is to resist or to flee evil. And we're, sh- we're, we're told that, uh, let's read verse, four, verse 7 again. This portion of my Bible is a little worn. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The first part of that verse was the submission. The second part here is to resist the devil, and he will flee from us. And so that is one aspect of fleeing evil. And I want to turn to the book of First Timothy, and then we'll read a little bit in Second Timothy, the encouraging words that Paul had for Timothy. And uh, I attribute that to uh, uh, a wise uh, older person in the church advising a younger one how to flee evil and have, and with encouragement, telling him how to uh, overcome and resist and flee evil. First Timothy chapter 6, and we'll read some of the first few verses here. First Timothy 6, beginning in verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So what we've learned, the good things we've learned, we need to continue to learn and that, uh, and to learn and to teach others. Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and can sit not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and, not, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy, strife, railings, and surmisings. Perhaps things we need to flee. Perverse, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw yourself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Society wants you to think about fleeing the evils as a punishment for you, but it is a blessing. And the godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can take nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. The reason for fleeing the evil is to avoid that. In a familiar passage here, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, and Paul's calling Timothy a man of God, these things and follow after righteousness. Follow after righteousness. You know, resist the other things, flee them, but follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. In verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. And in his second letter to Timothy, he also has some encouraging words. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, and we'll read beginning in verse 1 again. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And hopefully that's been continuing that we've learned from faithful men and we should be faithful men and women teaching our children and teaching others. You therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So you resist the things in this life to be a soldier for Christ. And if a man also strives for masteries, yet he is 
not crowned except he strives lawfully. The husbandman that is that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. And Paul continues to encourage a few more verses here. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Even though Paul was imprisoned, the words and the truth he was conveying <laughs> were not imprisoned. Verse 11 is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And then let's look over to verse 20. And we read, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And he encourages him to, to flee and to resist those of, of dishonor. Verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these... He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So very positive things to pursue while we flee and resist the evils of the world and of Satan the devil. And then the last point... The last key to perfection in the book of James is somewhat a tighter focus on what on point what key number five was. And that is don't speak evil one of another. And once again in the fourth chapter of James, verse 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Addressing us, brethren, he that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And then the words of Christ in Matthew 7 are often read and then he, he explains them what he's, what he's talking about in judgment. Because we, we do have to make judgments. But in Matthew 7, verse 1, he says, Judge not that you be not judged. And he addresses this subject of, of brethren uh, talking with and about one another. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And why behold you the mote that is in your brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how will you pull out... How will you say to your brother, let me pull out the beam out of your eye and behold, I mean a splinter out of your eye and a beam is in my eye. You hypocrite, first cast the beam out of your own eye and then you shall see clearly to cast out the splinter or the mote out of your brother's eye. So speak not evil one of another. And to under this key, it's good to think about, well, then how should we speak? And for that, I'll go back to the Proverbs. I know we spent some time there earlier uh, speaking about words, words, and it's, it's addressed under these two keys in the book of James that we've put together in this outline anyway. And uh, so I'll turn to Proverbs, the 12th chapter, verse 25. I don't think I've, I've read these uh, yet and I notice Psalm 12 doesn't have 25 verses so I'll go over to Proverbs bearing with me thank you Proverbs 12 verse 25 heaviness in the heart of a man makes it stoop but a good word makes it glad you know that's Psalm 103, we often say, isn't it? How good and how pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. And, you know, with, even as church members and, and Christians, we, we have this power to make someone's life heavy or we have the power to lighten it up, to make it a positive, cheerful um, kind of life. 
And so we have, we have a lot of power in our tongue and specifically instructed not to speak evil of one another. Then in the third chapter of Proverbs, verse 27, Proverbs 3, verse 27, Withhold not good from them to who it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do it. And that certainly applies to our words, encouraging words. And some brethren just have a talent and a knack for that or they recognize the blessing that they are to themselves and to others by speaking those words, writing those words in cards, texts, emails, and encouragement. And then in Proverbs, the 15th chapter, a couple of verses here. Proverbs 15, verse 23. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. In verse 30. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report makes the bones fat. Encouraging words, uplifting words, positive words among the brethren. Doesn't mean we don't have to address serious issues, but we, we can use that power to make a, a, a better, brighter life for our brethren. And then in conclusion, Proverbs, the 25th chapter, beginning in verse 11. Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver, as an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold and a wise reprover upon an obedient, an obedient ear. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. Are we refreshers? Hope so. Who boasts himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. But verse 15, by long forbearing, and yes, our, our, our walk sometimes is long and forbearing, is a prince persuaded, but a soft tongue can break his bone. Encouraging words. And brethren, let's think about the gifts, the spiritual gifts God informs us, us, us of, the keys to life and for happiness and, and fulfillment of his purpose that we can do now, do for us in this life and especially do for our brethren and others.